Welcome to the Welcome Genome Campus. Uh, it's an absolute honor and delight to have you here, and I look forward to talking to as many of you as I can uh, before, unfortunately, I have to shoot to London. What I thought I would try and do is tell you a little bit about where you are. So some of you may have been here before, but many of you may not. So tell you a little bit what, about you, where you are, and also tell you something about my research and, and what led me here. So what I studied, how I came to work on what I work on, and what I work on. And I'll try and do all that within half an hour. We may or may not succeed. Uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. So uh, the, the title of my talk is How Genomics Changes Everything, specifically in the context of malaria, which is what I work on, malaria parasites. But first of all, I just want to tell you where you are. So this is where you are. You're right about here. This is, a, this is an aerial picture of this campus taken nearly 100 years ago. And until um, only about 60 years ago, this was someone's home. Well, in fact, the building opposite the stately home was someone's home. And this opposite the home, this was the stables, and this was the garden. Obviously, when I say someone's, I mean a very rich uh, Cambridge family's home. <laughs> And this was the garden that produced the food that, that fed the house. And for hundreds of years, that's what was here. It was a stately home outside Cambridge. Then after the Second World War, uh, that, uh, this, this land and the hall and all of the gardens got sold. And it got sold to a company called Tube Research Investments. And Tube Invers Research Investments, I used to say something about them. They basically made steel tubes, but this place was more than just a manufacturing place. It was actually a research center, researching into the structure of metals. And in fact, one of the very first electron microscopes ever in Britain, um, only the second ever in Britain, was placed here in this tube research investments laboratory. I met a couple of people who worked here a few weeks ago as part of this time. This was in the, in the 50s and 60s and asked them, where the electron microscope was and he said it was in what used to be the butler's pantry because it had very thick walls um, which were good for protecting it from from various disturbances and we walked around the old hall to find what was the butler's pantry pantry and we discovered it we thought it was probably now where the gents lose were so it feels slightly <laughs> sacrilegious to be going to the toilet in where only the second electron microscope in britain was housed but that's what it was so um, this is what it looked like. And then something was happening just up the road while all this research was going on. Some other research was happening. And two really critical pieces of research. So on the left is, is three people who, who made really a huge impact on our understanding of the world. That's James Watson, Francis Crick, and Rosalind Franklin. And as of course you all know, those are the people who came up with the solution to the structure of DNA. So Watson and Crick looking, operating in a theoretical model um, using Rosalind Franklin's data and this very famous image, which is on the doorway to this room. We're in the Rosalind Franklin pavilion and realizing that the structure of DNA was this double helix. And then this man who you may not recognize, Fred Sanger. Fred Sanger is one of the very few people to ever win two Nobel Prizes. There are three people to ever win two Nobel Prizes, as far as I know. Does anyone know who, who one of the other people to win the two Nobel Prizes were, apart from Becky, apart from teachers? Any <laughs> students know? It's a name you're going to kick yourself but you didn't think of it. Something to do with radiation. One of the few women to win. <laughs> Marie Curie. Marie Curie was another person to win two Nobel Prizes. The third, interestingly, Linus Pauling won the interesting combination of the Chemistry Nobel Prize and the Peace Nobel Prize, which is quite an interesting combination. Anyway, Fred Sanger won two Nobel Prizes, and his second Nobel Prize was for working out a method to sequence DNA. And DNA, as you know, is a long string of letters, A, T, Cs, and Gs, nucleotides. And this was his method called the Sanger sequencing method. I won't, I won't bore you with the explanations. I used to do this as a PhD student. Believe me, it was incredibly painful and difficult, but it worked. And once he worked that out, someone came to the realization that, in fact, all you needed was enough DNA sequencing machines running for a long enough time in enough places, and eventually you would sequence all the letters in a genome. And the first person to start doing that on a eukaryotic organism was John Sulston, working up the road at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, working on a simple nematode worm. 
And then there was a technology change that realized that actually, if we did this for long enough, we could sequence the human genome. And that's when this place turned into this. So the Wellcome Trust, which is the second biggest medical charity, medical research charity in the world after the Gates Foundation, bought the land, bought the old building, bought the whole area and started building a genomics research institute here. And for the first 10 years of its life, the inside of the Sanger Institute looked a little like this, with rows and rows and rows of DNA sequencing machines. And those sequencing machines ran 24 hours a day for about nine years, and eventually um, they sequenced the entire human genome. It was an international project with contributions from all around the world. The Wellcome Sanger Institute contributed about a third of the complete genome, which was more than any other um, single institute. So this is the place where you could honestly say that the human genome project, the human genome was sequenced for the first time. But something very interesting happened about 10 years ago, and that is that the technology that we use to sequencing DNA, to sequence DNA changed. So we no longer use Sanger sequencing. The place was named for Fred Sanger. We no longer do Sanger sequencing anymore. We use a different technology, which again, I'm happy to explain, but I, I won't because of time constraints. But essentially, it totally changed the game in terms of the number and amount of genomes that we can sequence. So it took nine years and thousands of people all over the world to sequence the human genome. We now sequence about 25,000 genomes here on campus, just as part of the Sanger Institute. It takes about two days, and it costs about $1,000 to sequence a human genome now. And the implications for that are just mind-boggling. To, to, to give you a nice image of what that looks like, there used to be at the Sanger Institute, above the reception, there was a ticker tape kind of screen with ACs, Gs, and Ts scrolling across it at the speed at which we were sequencing. You know, like if you, if you watch uh, sports or something, or, or um, uh, investment channel, and the, the scores or the stock prices scroll across the bottom of the screen. We had one of those for bases. They switched that thing off when they moved in the new sequencing machines because it just became a blur of light. It was totally meaningless. And the implications for that, I get a bit carried away when I talk about that, but they're huge. Just to give you a few examples, these two beautiful girls are from a project that's been running on this campus for the last few years called the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Project. So every year in this country and around the world, children are born with severe developmental defects and with no diagnosis, with no known cause. They don't fit into any of the categories that we, th what we know about. And so what they do now is you sequence the two parents and the child. And you're looking for, because the parents are healthy and don't have the same developmental issues, and the child does, you're looking for changes in the DNA that are present in the child and not in the parent. And it's been done now on tens of thousands of children. It's a phenomenal project. And it comes up with results like this, where these two girls who um, are totally unrelated to each other were identified as sharing a mutation in the same genes. And you, you essentially are defining new syndromes and new diseases and connecting people. So this is part of a BBC documentary where the, you see the mums talking in the kitchen and it's just amazing. They had never met each other, lived on opposite ends of the country. And there they are talking and saying, well, you know, it's as if our children are twins. They're really that similar to each other. We had no idea each other existed. So kind of defining what human disease is and understanding it by sequencing the DNA. But of course, we don't just sequence humans, we also sequence all sorts of infectious organisms. And because infectious organisms evolve at a faster rate, you can see how the changes in the DNA, you can use that information to understand how different organisms are related to each other. So this is just showing this on two different um, uh, scales. This is both work done here at the campus. So these are children in the special care baby unit up the road at Addenbrooke's Hospital all of whom were infected with MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a nasty infection which you can pick up in hospitals. And it's always a problem for hospitals and a challenge to know whether an infection was acquired in the hospital or they picked it up at home. And it's a really big issue for hospitals because if it's acquired in the hospital, then the NHS fines the hospital um, for not having good enough infection control. So they have to know what's an outbreak and what's not an outbreak. And in this study, there was a cluster of cases that they didn't really know whether it was an outbreak or not. 
um, they sequenced the MRSA from all the babies and realized that clearly it was an outbreak. All of them were all of the bacteria were related to each other. They could also find individuals in the community who were related to or knew the children, who had visited the children, who were also infected. And eventually they worked out it must be a healthcare worker who was inadvertently transmitting that organism from baby to baby. So they could screen all the healthcare workers working or in association with that baby unit, identify the person, decolonize them, which I'm assured is not as bad as it sounds, decolonize them and basically stop the outbreak. And they did all of that just from genome sequencing. So that's on a very local level. On a much more global level, this is how cholera spreads around the world. So everyone always thought that cholera just popped up in different places and there were local outbreaks. By sequencing samples of the cholera bacteria from all around the world, we've learned that actually there are these waves of transmission that sweep from the Bay of Bengal across the north of Africa and down around Africa in a very defined way. And they happen every 10 or 15 years in exactly the same cycle. Why or how, we don't know. But the fact that all of global cholera is related in this way is something amazing. And then the final example is, is one of my favorites. So there's now a project here on the genome campus to sequence the genomes of every living eukaryotic organism. So the, the goal there is to really understand the, the story of evolution, of how the world became what it is. This is one of my all-time favorite images um, in, in everything. So this is a page from Darwin's notebook. And this is the first known phylogenetic tree. So phylogenetic trees in, tell you about how species are related to each other. And this is a really famous image. So you can, he sketches out this thing where these, at the end of these branches are individual species. And he's, he's clearly sort of thinking through evolution by natural selection. And there's the wonderful little iconic, I think. You can almost you know, hear him thinking, I wonder if this is how the world works. If you Google, I'm not saying do this night right now, if you Google Darwin, I think, tattoo, you'd be surprised how many people have this tattooed somewhere on their body. It's that kind of iconic, iconic image. And I actually said that at a presentation just earlier this week, and someone at the back put, stuck up her hand and said, I've got that tattoo. It's the first time I've ever met someone. It's just, it's brilliant. Anyway, so we can use sequencing to sort of track the very evolution of life on Earth. So... That's the Welcome Genome Campus today. It's gone from this kind of sleepy little, um, uh, you know, stately home to this incredible hub of genomics, sequencing, uh, analysis, and information with two big, in two big institutes, Sanger Institutes and EBI. Okay, so that's where you are. I thought I would then tell you a little bit about how I got here. So what was my path through university to get here? So I grew up in New Zealand. Uh, I'm not saying that I spent all my life doing this, but certainly uh, there was the university I was at, you could look out of the window of your flat and see the mountains and judge whether it was a good ski day or a bad ski day, and there was certainly a correlation with how many people were in classes based on what the weather was like in the mountains. So I studied biochemistry in New Zealand and got interested in genetics and, and how genes work. Um, and then got lucky enough to, to get a scholarship to do a PhD in Cambridge. And I took, and now it seems insane to me supervising students, but I just read some papers and found someone whose work I found very interesting. He was working on how proteins move around the cell and what makes them go to different locations. And he worked at this very iconic um, institute called the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology that has produced more Nobel Prize winners than, than any other institute. Not that that's the only measure of success in science, I hasten to add, but it's, it's quite an amazing thing. And I came to do a PhD here in, um, in 1993, working on protein trafficking. And then as I was doing my PhD, and it was all very interesting, and this is how cells work, and this is the stuff of life, I decided I wanted to do a carry on in research, but I wanted to do something more relevant. You know, yeast are cool, and you can do experiments in yeast, but actually, you know, what affects people, and, and what can we do about them? And so for my postdoctoral research, I went to this place the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta and Georgia, and I started working on this organism here. And I, I started this because, let's see if I can find my cursor. Oh, there it goes. I got fascinated by this particular problem. So these, these things here are all red blood cells. 
And in this cell here, this red blood cell was infected by a malaria parasite about 48 hours ago. So the malaria parasite gets into the red blood cell, it chews up all the hemoglobin, it multiplies, and then after about 48 hours, this amazing thing happens. I still think it's amazing 20 years later. So the infected red blood cell bursts open and all the parasites come out and then they start bumping into the red blood cells around them and they push them and they poke them and they prod them and eventually they worm their way into the new red blood cell. If you keep your eye on this plucky little parasite down here, you see it perfectly. It deforms the cell and then it just pulls its way inside the red blood cell and infects that red blood cell and starts the whole process again. And the whole thing take, takes about a minute um, the parasites all come out. They can't live outside the cells. They need to get inside new cells in order to divide. And to me, that's just the most fascinating question. How does one cell get inside another cell? And especially because that is critical for um, the process of disease. And this is just one part of the fairly complicated malaria parasite life cycle, which is not nearly as complicated as you think. There's basically half that happens in mosquitoes and half that happens in us. And when we get infected, the parasite goes to our liver, grows in our liver for a couple of weeks, and then comes out into your blood. And it's this stage where it's infecting blood cells and chewing up your blood, red blood cells and dissolving them and infecting new red blood cells. That's what causes all the symptoms and all the pathology of malaria. So to me, this was the perfect project. It's a fascinating question. It's cool biology, and also it's something very relevant. And what was particularly important to me, it's something that actually we don't hear a lot about. So if you hear about malaria in the UK, it's usually things like this, right? And this is not at all to pick on Harry Styles, who I'm sure is a wonderful human being. But often what you see on the UK TV is when someone famous, usually a boy band for reasons I've never understood, gets sent to um, a malaria hospital somewhere in Africa. And you hear the story of malaria, but you hear it through kind of their reaction to it, which has always struck me as very odd. So either someone famous gets sent somewhere where there's malaria, or somewhere famous gets malaria. So I'm sure this happened too far away for you to remember, but Cheryl Cole got malaria um, several years ago. This was covered a lot in the, in the newspapers. Here's a quote from Simon Cowell, which is, which is a wonderful quote. I don't know much about malaria, but apparently it was the really serious strain of it. We were worried, but look, this is life. People get sick. She got very sick. You've got to deal with it. That's what reality TV is all about. <laughs> Remarkable. Um, in fact, this story is the only time I've ever written an angry email to a newspaper. So it wasn't this story. It was actually it was in The Guardian. They ran a headline about Cheryl Cole. And under that, it said she contracted the virus that causes malaria whilst on holiday in Africa. And I put all caps on on my, on my keyboard and said, it's not a virus, it's a parasite. I got very angry. They changed it in a, in a later iteration. I don't think if that was anything to do with me. But, but of course, this isn't what malaria really is. This is what malaria is. This is um, a lot of sick children in very resource poor settings. Um, and the overall statistics are, are still staggering. Interestingly, malaria didn't always used to be this. So you don't have to go back very far. And actually, malaria was in places that you don't expect. You, if you'd been living 100 years ago, you could have caught malaria about 30 miles away from here. Um, if you'd gone out into East Anglia, there was malaria in the East Anglia and the Kent marshes up until pretty much early in the last century. And my first ever faculty position was at a university in Alabama. Here are the top causes of death 100 years ago, malaria, 7.5% of deaths. So malaria used to be in a lot of places that it's not anymore. This is where malaria is now, roughly all the way around the middle of the world, 40% of the world's population at risk, about 250 million cases every year, about half a million deaths every year, and most of those deaths are in children under the age of five. There's no vaccine. You can't stop someone getting malaria. All you can do is treat someone once they've got it. So that's why malaria is interesting to me. It's a cool biological question. It's obviously a very significant global question. What does that any of this have to do with genomes and genome sequences? Well, in common with a lot of weird organisms, and one of those weird organisms being the whipworm, which some of you have worked on the genome as part of the Genome Decoders project, we actually still don't know a lot about what the malaria genome does. So the falciparum, Plasmodium falciparum is the parasite that causes most malaria deaths. It's got 14 chromosomes, it's got about 5,000 genes. It was sequenced 
now nearly 15 years ago, but still for most of those genes, we don't know what they do. And that's because parasites are weird and only distantly related to organisms we know a lot about. So we know a lot about fruit flies and yeast and so on. We don't know a lot about these organisms. And so part of what we do is to try to understand the function of genes. And, the, and if we understand the function of genes, then we can um, identify which targets are good for drugs or vaccines. So one way, I'll just tell you about a couple of different ways we've been doing that. One way is to try and knock genes out one by one. So you take a parasite, we can grow them in our lab, we just need a little bit of blood and a little bit of um, uh, culture media and they grow quite happily. And we've got methods to delete one gene at a time. And we, we use this method, um, which I won't go into the details of, but essentially we insert into the middle of a gene this little cassette here and the key thing about the cassette is in that cassette is a DNA barcode. All the DNA barcode is just 10 base pairs of DNA, 10 ACs, Gs, and Ts. But each gene, we insert a different barcode. So we've got a parasite strain that's missing one gene and has a unique little sequence that is unique to that barcode. And the reason that's so powerful is that we can then use PCR, which you've probably heard of, and amplify that barcode, all of those barcodes, and sequence them and then you can tell the relative abundance of all of the different parasites. So I can take all of my parasites, each of which lack one gene, but they all lack a different gene, grow them all together, and work out which ones grow fast and which ones grow slow. And that tells you which genes are important and which genes aren't important. Another way to think of this, this is completely my PhD student's analogy, which I love. He said he t stole it from a, a biochemical society book. He said, there's an old joke that says, how do you tell the difference between a biochemist and a geneticist? And the answer is, if you give them both a car, the biochemist, biochemist will essentially break the car down and melt it and tell you, well, this car is 40% steel and 20% plastic and 10% glass, and it will break it down into its components. Whereas what a geneticist do, will do, will take pieces off the car one by one and ask whether the car still works or not. So essentially, what we're trying to do is work out what kind of car is a malaria parasite. Is it a car like a Formula One car where they've probably taken off everything that the car doesn't need to run, right? I assume no windscreen wipers, I assume no CD player, um, those sorts of things. Or is it a regular family car? Or is it a car like this, which is an amphibious car, which has an outdoor motor, outboard motor as well as an engine, a lot of wheels? You think you could pull a lot of things off that car and it would still drive down the road. So who here thinks that a malaria parasite is like a Formula One car, where pretty much every gene is absolutely essential and important for that parasite to grow? Any hands? Couple of hands? Who thinks it might be like a, a regular car? You know, some things are important, some things not. Kind of middle of the road. Some more hands. Amphibious car. Le actually, lots of redundant, most hands. I was totally an amphibious car when we, when we started this project. And it's partly because of this weird life cycle, right? It lives in your liver, it lives in your blood cells, it lives in mosquitoes. You might think that the genes it needs for each of those different stages are different. Turns out... Formula One car. So two-thirds of the genes in the malaria parasite are absolutely required for that malaria parasite to grow. If you compare that to our cells, if you grow our cells in a dish and you do the same experiment, only about 15% of our genes are, are required for an individual cell to grow. And these are various other organisms, nematode worms, yeast, and so on. The biggest proportion of any genome that's ever been studied in this way. So why is this useful? Well, it's useful because we can um, prioritize drug targets because you want to develop a drug against a gene that's absolutely required for the parasite to grow, right? So that's been an incredibly useful thing. Interestingly, we also found one gene that if you delete it, it makes the parasite grow faster than, than regular parasites, which was fascinating and turned out to be a really interesting story, but I don't have time to, to tell you the details, but I'm happy to tell anyone who wants to ask me about it later. Okay. I'm going to skip over this bit because I'm, I'm running way long. But just to say, 
Um, we're also experimenting with using robots in our work because some of this stuff is just very slow. So this is a, this is a robot that a, a PhD student, one of my, my most heartwarming moments as a, as a faculty member was when my PhD student, Theo, came into my lab and he looked slightly embarrassed and he into my office. He said, you know, I'm thinking we could really do with a robot to speed up how we grow parasites. I said, that sounds like a great idea. He said, yeah, I've actually built a robot and I want to test it. So he just ordered a bunch of parts off Amazon and put together a robot on his kitchen table. It turns out we couldn't use his robot for, for rather boring reasons. But then he bought another open, open source robot and adapted it and strapped pipettes to it. And we now use that in our lab to, um, to grow parasites at a faster rate. Totally his idea, totally his creativity and amazing um, uh, skill. He's an extraordinary person. He'll be my boss one day. There's absolutely no question of it. Um, and I think my favorite bit is, and he's gonna, is it, does it go to it soon? Uh, this was just a demo. We've been showing this to lots of different people around the world um, to see if the, this will help them in their work as well. Um, yes, he, for some reason, thought it would be cool to slap a GoPro on the robot so you get the robot's point of view of, of what growing malaria parasites is like. He also set up a Twitter feed for the, for the robot, so the robot tweeted, um, which was funny for a while, but all the... All the robot does is tweet, I need more tips, I need more tips. <laughs> that got a bit old in your Twitter feed. So Twitter feed is no longer active. Anyway, just the one other example of how we use genomics is back to that question I have about how red blood cells and parasites interact. So that process involves a lot of contacts between the surface of the red blood cell and the surface of the parasite. And the question is, how does that contact happen? It must happen because there are proteins on the surface of the parasite, and they must interact with proteins on the surface of the red cells. But actually working out what interacts with what has proved to be incredibly difficult and uh, taken a lot of time. And to cut a long story short, we were able to use a, a systematic approach, screening a whole lot of different proteins and a whole lot of different genes, to find an interaction between a parasite protein called RH5 and a red blood cell protein called basogen. This is what that interaction looks like um, using X-ray structure. And it turns out that that interaction is absolutely critical for the invasion process to happen. So if you block the interaction by adding antibodies, you decrease the in invasion efficiency. And all of these different parasite strains were collected from all different places around the world. And it, it, this, this interaction seemed to be important for all of them. So we're now using these in combination with other genetic data to look at um, this as a potential vaccine target. And this is just to show you what happens. So this is now the same kind of invasion assays, but we've got added in antibodies to block... Oh, I was going to hope that this works. Please let this work. Yes. So these are the same kind of movies that I showed before, but now there are antibodies around to, to block that interaction. What you can see now is the poor little uh, parasites pushing and pushing and pushing, um, and they really still have this massive effect on the surface of the red cell. They deform it. They try their hardest, but they just can't get into the red cells. And obviously, the hope is that that will turn into a vaccine um, that might be able to protect people from malaria. So just in the last two minutes, I, I wanted to say just one other thing about the kind of work we do here. And that's, this, this whole field of genetics and genomics is absolutely exploding. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. So, so you may have heard about 23andMe, which was apparently the most popular um, Christmas present in the US last year, amazingly. That blows my mind that people sign up to this. Um, I mean, let me scale back. So it's, 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 on the one hand, it's marketed as a cool and interesting thing to find out about yourself, and there's definitely that side of it. But also, you can find out some things you might not want to know about your future health and your, all of those things. And should commercial companies be doing that? And what's their responsibility to provide you with support? And now, genome sequencing is becoming mainstream in the NHS. Again, what are the responsibilities? Do the people in the NHS understand the technology? Can they provide support? All of these questions, it's hitting um, the NHS, it's hitting your Spotify playlist, so you can take your 23andMe um, SNP code and they will give you a Spotify playlist based on your predicted ethnic background, which is just the most ridiculous thing. And some really quite troubling things about how people are using genetics to propagate their own view of the world and, on, on, of, of things. And of course, you also get the 
the spillover into movies like Rampage, the movie about the CRISPR edited um, gorilla. So, you know, it's, it's hitting the whole world. And the question that we have here is, well, what's our responsibilities as scientists? Is it just to do our research and then let all that stuff happen? Or is it actually to engage in the discussion around genomics? And we think it's absolutely our responsibility, both personally, it's my responsibility as a scientist, and as an institution, it's our responsibility to engage with the world. So I'm director of this program called Connecting Science, which aims to enable everyone to explore genomics and its impact on research, health, and society. We run um, conferences and training courses for professional audiences here in this conference center and other places on campus. So while you're wandering around, please you know, um, make the most of our amazing facilities. I particularly ask you to look at the amazing trees that are um, around the outside of the conference. Those are all real phylogenetic trees showing the relationship between different organisms, but all made by just the size of holes that are punched in acoustic panels. It's amazing stuff. Um, and we also do a huge amount of public engagement. And the work with IRIS on genome decoders is a part of that, but we do some other things as well. So over in the corner, you'll see some Iron Age skeletons that were actually excavated here on the campus as part of an archaeological dig. This being the genome campus, of course, we sequenced the skeletons. And uh, we made uh, an engagement activity about ancient DNA and archaeology and took it around to schools in our area and made this exhibit and made it open. And we run events. This is the amazing Kim Judge taking DNA sequencing machines out into schools and sequencing people's lunches to tell them what they're eating, um, genome decoders, all sorts of great work. So I think that the, I think my message is that a, a scientific career could take you anywhere. Um, follow your instincts and follow what interests you. I got into malaria because I was just fascinated by the biology, and then it's turned out to be the most wonderful and exciting career um, I've got to travel to all sorts of interesting places and meet amazing people. And none of this is possible without a huge collaborative group of people. So all of those people who put collaboration and teamwork up in what they thought about science, that's absolutely true. I think now more than ever, you know, the science, the image of a scientist working on their own in a room is just not true anymore. All of the stuff we do is in collaboration and networks with my amazing team, with friends and colleagues in Kenya and Cambridge and the U.S., um, and, and, and this is the Connecting Science team that deliver the conference and the public engagement events. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I, uh, more encouraging. Um, so obviously, to, to get malaria, you, there are three things, humans, parasites, and mosquitoes. And with climate change, uh, with the change in temperature, it's probably encouraging the spread of certain mosquito species. Um, I think it, uh, it's not exactly my area of expertise. I think that human migration is having a bigger impact than, than mosquito spread. But certainly it, it's, it's going to put um, malaria, mosquito, malaria carrying mosquitoes in places that they weren't before. How, sorry. Sorry. No, go, please. Um, have you ever been out to a country where they've infected, and if so, where? Yeah, so, I mean, it's one of the like, enormous privileges of working on this disease. So I, I work on, um, work with collaborators in Kenya, in Ghana, in Senegal, um, in Thailand, in India, in Colombia. Colombia, one of my all-time favorite countries. I cannot overemphasize what a cool country Colombia is. Highly recommend visiting there. Um, and it's, it's a privilege to do that. Uh, it's also something you need to take quite seriously. So there's a history of uh, UK and developed country scientists kind of going to those places, collecting a bunch of samples, taking them back and doing cool science and becoming famous and publishing papers and not involving the researchers that are there and the people that are there. So we try and do that in a very considered way. Um, I have quite a lot of students from Africa and um, from Asia who come to my lab to visit, to work, to learn stuff. And we try and transfer back whenever we can. When I go, I always take my malaria meds. Always take your malaria meds. You don't want to get malaria. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering how you manage the need to release information that you're producing yes. and the need to ensure that there's, a, there's a, an accurate public 
understanding of what you're doing because it seems to me that there's a massive potential for the information that gets out there to cause problems. Yes. So I think that there are two answers to that question. In terms of scientific information, it's a fundamental principle of this place that we release all data freely and openly. So the sort of the raw data that you can use to use for research, the, science, the, the sequence data is all released. And that came from the Human Genome Project. So the, the story, which is a really interesting story, when the Human Genome Project was being sequenced, there was, a, there was a publicly funded Human Genome Project, but there was also a company, a private company, that was trying to sequence the human genome at the same time. And they were planning to patent the genes and then essentially sell the sequence information to pharmaceutical companies to make money. And it was a race between the two. It, it's officially called a draw. So the two, com the two things published the genome at the same time. If you actually look under the hood, um, the private company used all of the public information. They used all the public um, project data to make their stuff better. So we won, just so everyone knows, we won. <laughs> um, so in terms of the data, we make it all freely available. In terms of the information, that's why I think this public engagement thing is so important because unless scientists can't stand up and talk about what they're doing and why they're doing it and what it means and what it doesn't mean, then you get the potential for misinformation. I th you probably all saw the, the CRISPR baby um, furore at the end of last year where a scientist in China allegedly, allegedly because it's never been published so it's never been verified, um, CRISPR modified human embryos and it re-implanted those embryos and babies were born with CRISPR modified genes. Um, it's still shocking to me that that happened, but you know, unless there were people when that happened and it was out there, unless there were scientists who were able to stand up and say, this is illegal, it could not happen in this country, it could not happen in other countries, this is totally outside scientific norms, this is what it means, this, this is what it doesn't mean, then things can get out of hand very fast. And I think there's no substitute for you know, scientists talking from their experience about this. That's the best. Um, I wondered whether there was a, a role for a similar kind of project on the malaria parasite that we've been doing on the whipworm, whether there's any information left that could be done by students. For malaria parasite, probably not, because um, essentially people have been staring at that genome for a long period of time, um, and there's been a huge amount of study on it. But the tree of life, I think, is... It's a huge opportunity. So in some ways, the Genome Decoders, the Whipworm Project, is almost, I think, a, a kind of a, a little taster of what could happen. So this place will be sequencing all sorts of crazy organisms over the next 20 years. And the question is, how do those genomes get annotated by whom? Who's involved in the process? So with malaria, probably not so much. But the sort of general principle of citizen science around genomics and genome annotation, I think the Tree of Life Project has amazing um, potential for that. Sorry, um, could you briefly explain how that gene worked, which sped up oh, the growth? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the malaria parasite, as the bit that I work on, invades red blood cells and chews up the red blood cells and then comes out and invades new red blood cells. And as it does that, people, the people it's in, the people it's parasitizing, are getting sicker and sicker because they're running out of red blood cells and they get anemic and they can't process oxygen and in some cases they die. Obviously, for the parasite, that's a terrible strategy, right? It has to get out of the person and into another person. And it does that. It's a, it's a eukaryote, it's a complex organism, and it has a sexual and an asexual cycle. So the cycle that's going round and round and round the blood, red blood cells is just mitosis. It's going over and over. A small, small subpopulation of those cells differentiate into meiosis, and they form these, these sexual forms that just circulate around the body waiting and hoping that a mosquito bites that person and picks up the sexual forms. So in a person, in a real live infection, the genes that trigger that change from mitosis to meiosis are really crucial. But in my lab, in the red blood cells, actually anything that differentiates into the meiotic forms is, just slows the culture down because you get parasites that become sexual forms and then they don't form more new parasites. So that gene was actually the master regulator, um, the key regulator of that developmental differentiation. And it was that, that discovery that actually led to a whole lot of work about how that switch happens. So it turned out to be something really cool. Thank you.
You showed us that work where um, you'd put, was it antibodies with yeah. the cells to stop the parasites getting into the new yeah. red blood cells? Um, and you said that could be leading to a vaccine. Yeah. How recent is that work and how far away could a vaccine be? Um, so we, so the, the first human vaccine trials for that target are underway now in Oxford. We're not involved in that work. Um, they're at phase 2A. So vaccine development is long and tedious. They've done phase 1, which is where you vaccinate people and you just see whether the vaccine is safe. That's all you're doing. You're not looking to see whether it's effective, see whether it's safe. And you do that on a small number of people, five. I say people, let's be honest, it's students. So um, they put ads all around Oxford, they ask people to sign up, and uh, it's students. Um, and then after that, they do what's called a phase 2A, where you vaccinate, again, a small number of people, and then you deliberately infect them with malaria, and you ask them to come back every day, and you test them until you see whether they've got malaria or not. And as soon as they do, obviously you give them drugs and you treat them, and they're fine. It's all fine. Um, I, I, I always think being a scientist or a clinician involved in that project must be terrifying. You know, what if the patient doesn't come back? What if they go on holiday? You know, anyway. Um, and those, those first efficacy trials are underway now. If they work, and I, if I'm honest, I don't think that it, this will be enough on its own. I think we'll need more targets than just this then it's probably another five years before there's a large trial and probably another five years before there's a really big trial. So, you know, maybe in, if everything falls like dominoes, maybe in 10 years that might be a vaccine. Right. Lots of really good questions. You're around for a little bit longer. I am. Thank so you all very much. Please, if you get a chance, talk to Julian. But in the meantime, I never cease to be inspired every time I come to this place. So thank you very much, Julian.